Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we continue our series of sermons called Word Became Flesh from the Gospel according to John. In the flashy world of social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, the name of the game is followers and likes. The more you get, the more successful you are on the internet. When Jesus was on earth, there were times when he had more followers than anyone else. Many people were particularly impressed by his miracles, or as John calls them, signs. If he'd been running in the popularity stakes, Jesus would have won hands down. But as John points out at the end of chapter 2, Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people, and he knew what was in a man. In this talk, Hayden Smith introduces us to a man who came to Jesus with questions. Nicodemus gets more than he bargained for as Jesus challenges all his presuppositions. Following Jesus isn't an impulsive, shallow response to signs. It's a deep spiritual response to the one the signs point to. And that changes everything. But before we hear from Hayden, let's listen to the Bible. The passage is John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. And so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, 
and will not come into the light, for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Hayden. Earlier this month, the Prime Minister announced that on his recommendation, King Charles had approved a new Governor-General, Miss Samantha Moston, who will take up the position from the 1st of July. Now, truth be told, I don't know anything about this new Governor-General, but I know this. The Head of State is supposed to be someone who embodies the best about a country. So let's imagine for a second that we were given the task of creating a recipe for the best Australian by combining our best and brightest. A dash of this person, a sprinkle of this person, a pinch of that person, a mix of people that would make Australians proud. If in the first century they had a Governor General, or they had not an Australian of the year but an Israelite of the year, one of the first names that would come to mind would be Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, but of course we've been kind of trained to think that when we hear Pharisee, we automatically think religious bad guy. But he is a teacher, verse 10, an authority in Israel. And as a recent book highlights, Pharisaism was a heroic effort to prepare the ground for the kingdom of God, emphasizing the ethical and compassionate elements of Jewish law. And in addition to verse 1 being a Pharisee, Nicodemus was also a respected member of the ruling council. Sometimes it's called the Sanhedrin because only 70 people were chosen to serve in that council and court for the people. You see, Nicodemus was, like other Pharisees, zealous for God. And that's not a bad thing to be passionate about God and religion. But it seems that Jesus' criticism of them comes from the fact that they'd got the wrong end of the stick and they were not necessarily willing to change their mind. They had zeal, certainly, but it was zeal without knowledge of God. They'd misunderstood the heart of God and therefore they'd misunderstood the mission of Jesus. And this is clear as we pick up in John 3. Let's have a look at verse 2. He, that is Nicodemus, came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. This is a very gracious and respectful greeting from Nicodemus to Jesus. Presumably, Nicodemus had heard the reports from chapter 2 of the many signs and miracles that Jesus had done in Jerusalem. Presumably, Nicodemus had heard the public endorsement that the prophet John the Baptist had given to Jesus in chapter 1. And now Nicodemus, a man of God himself, has come to Jesus, another man of God, to presumably exchange teaching and wisdom for the reciprocal giving of honour, to explore their common religious and political goals. And certainly, though Jesus was, socially speaking, Nicodemus subordinate, this Pharisee comes with an olive branch. He compliments Jesus as a new teacher here in Israel. But he was surprised by Jesus' reply. Because Jesus' response is both confusing but also critical. Nicodemus here comes with the same confidence that we see in Luke 10, where another Pharisee comes and asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the inference is clear. He's pretty much saying, you know what? Um, roughly speaking, I feel like I'm ballpark. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to heaven. I think I'm on the right track. I've just come to you for a little bit of advice, instruction would be strong, advice on where I can fine-tune my spiritual life. To which Jesus replies, with that attitude, you are not even close to the kingdom of God. You see, this is what he says in verse 2. Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And in verse 7, he says specifically to Nicodemus, verse 7, you must be born again. As some of you know, my dream in life is to be a farmer. <laughs> and as many of you would know, I would make a terrible farmer. Any objection? Any objection? No. Um, you see, if I wanted to be a farmer, I wouldn't need a book 
farming for incurably incompetent people, I would need to start my life over. I would need to go back and be born as a different person to a different family in a different place. I'd need to live, presumably, as a child, be weaned on a farm, to live in the country. I'd need to have a childhood where I learned the land. I'd need to have different skills and passions. I'd need to be hardworking and tough and good with my hands. I'd need to skip Bible school and spend time being schooled in the way of farming. In short, if I wanted to be a farmer, the only thing I would need to change about me, and it's a very small thing, is everything about me. I'd need to be a totally different person. And when Jesus says you need to be born again, that's kind of what he's saying. You might as well go back and start again because you need to be entirely different. It's not that you just need to brush up on religion. You need to be born again. You need a completely different life. Even for a religious person, even for a respectable person, what is required to be good with God, that is on good terms with God, to be welcomed home into heaven, is not a tweak but a total transformation. And so all this language of radical change of being born again has left Nicodemus understandably a little confused. Verse 4, he said to him, that is to Jesus, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And the answer is no, unless you have a shrinking ray or a time machine. It's just not possible. So Jesus explains. When he's speaking about being born again of new life, he's not talking about a second physical birth, but of a spiritual rebirth. I'll read to you from verses 5 to 8. Truly, truly, Jesus says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. A physical body gives birth to a physical person, but for a spiritual rebirth, well, that is a work of the Spirit of God. And as with the wind, we can't see it, but we see its effects. So we cannot see the Spirit of God, but we see its effects in bringing new birth to ordinary people such as you and I. Nicodemus is now more confused than ever. Verse 9, he says, how can these things be? And Jesus is very critical of Nicodemus here. Why is that? Because Nicodemus is a person who both studies and teaches the Old Testament scriptures, but he doesn't seem to know them very well. Because one of the key ideas in the Old Testament to which Jesus has just alluded is there in Ezekiel 36. It says this, I, that is God, will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. This is a promise that through the Spirit of God, people will be washed clean of their sin. That is from our selfishness, from our smug self-confidence before God and before others. And we will be given a new heart. Nicodemus thought that we were talking spiritual tune-up. No, Jesus is saying we're talking spiritual heart transplant. Uh, friends of ours had a little girl called Eva, Eva Celeste. And before she was born, it was clear that she had some problems with her heart. She needed three significant surgeries, and it was far from clear before she was born that she would make it. Uh, when she was four years old, Eva's mum posted this on Facebook. She said, four years ago, no truer words were ever said about my Eva. This is what was written. This is little Eva. She is one week old and she has a wonky heart. Her parents and big sister love Jesus. She has already had one heart operation with more to come. I don't know what comes next, but I do know this. Jesus loves this little one. We are glad you are here, little Eva. You are very loved. And though you, like the rest of us, are a little bit weak and a little bit wonky. God is strong, kind, and above all, at Christmas when she was born, we know that God is with us. Eva is now seven, and though she has a long way to go, she is, in the words of her mum, a strong, kind, funny, and caring little girl. But as we look back, we thank God for those heart surgeries. 
I don't know how little Eva did it. I don't know how her parents have coped through it all. But though scary and painful, the skill and care of the surgeons have given Eva a life that she wouldn't have otherwise had. This is what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. This is what Jesus is saying to us. Our physical hearts might be fine, but spiritually speaking, we have a problem because our spiritual hearts don't work properly. They do not love properly. They do not love the Lord and they do not love our neighbour as they ought. And so God looks at us with compassion and says, you need a new heart. You need a new life. Now, Nicodemus' question earlier, well, how can these things be, was both an ignorant question, but also an insightful question, because to give new life is no easy task. And here, Jesus, in verse 14, reminds Nicodemus of another passage from Numbers 21. This is what Jesus says in verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. The Son of Man is Jesus' code for himself. And as he recalls that story, that story in which God had provided for his people, he'd rescued them from Egypt. They'd walked through the Red Sea on dry land, and now God had provided for them bread and water and quail. And yet God's people were deeply ungrateful, and they failed to trust him and to give thanks to him as they ought. And so a curse fell on them. As unbelief had poisoned their hearts, now snakes that God sent on them as judgment poisoned their bodies. And through Moses' petition, God had mercy on them and said, Moses, lift up a snake. And any person who comes and looks at that snake in faith, they'll be healed in their bodies and we trust, cured of their unbelief. That was then Jesus saying, now it is no different. Because the Son of Man will be lifted up. In John's Gospel, we've read already that John the Baptist refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God with all of the sacrificial overtones. We've already heard Jesus say at the wedding, my hour has not yet come and that ominous hour of his death grows ever nearer. Because Jesus knows what will happen. Just as the snake was on a pole, so he would be hoisted and nailed to a cross. But he knows that just like the snake was not without purpose, his ministry is not without purpose either. For any person who comes to him and looks upon the cross with faith will receive healing in their body and in their spirit. John 3, 16 and 17 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Easter was not so long ago, but as we look back, we remember that that is the time where we see the measure of God's love. That God the Father would send the Son into the world not to condemn but to save that God the Son would gladly come and give his life as a sacrifice for others, that the Spirit would, verse 8, give new birth to those whom he is calling to belief in Jesus and strengthening to live for him this day. That new life would come, and this is not a complicated idea, though it's a confronting idea, that new life would be given. If you would have a new life, then someone must give you that new life. Someone must give you their life and that's at the heart of the gospel that Jesus says I will give my life for you so that you can have a new life both here and in heaven so that you can be born again and to forego that love as some choose to do is to forfeit the offer of life that is in Christ Jesus to reject life is to choose death it is to choose condemnation These are not my words, these are the words of Jesus, given soberly, but from a place of deep concern, John 8, 24. He says, if you don't have faith in me, you will die, and your sins will not be forgiven. Some of you know we have a new dog called Frankie. And as with any new dog, there's the competition. Who in the family will be his favourite? Uh, Who thinks it's one of the children? Hands up, you think the children are his favourite? Hands up if you think I'm the favourite? 
That's not enough hands. <laughs> hands up if you think Libby in the front row is the favourite. Quite right, Libby is the favourite. But it's early days, Libby, this may change. <laughs> but it does mean that at home, if you want to know where Frankie is, you just have to ask the question, well, where is Libby? Wherever Libby is, there is Frankie. And this is the teaching of John's Gospel, not with Libby and Frankie, but with Jesus and life. If you want to ask where is life, just ask where is Jesus? Because Jesus and life go hand in hand. They are connected. And if you think, you know what, I'm not so keen on that Jesus bit, but I'd love the life bit. It doesn't work that way. You cannot reject Jesus and beckon life to come to you because it will not come because life and Jesus go hand in hand. And so if you will come to Jesus, you will receive life eternal. That is the promise of John 3.16. And yet some people will still not come. Why is that? Well, this is the answer that John 3 gives. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. This is a hard pill to swallow. To become a Christian takes a great deal of courage because you have to admit your failings. And that's not easy to do. It's not easy to recognise that one is not, has lived in a way that is self-serving or small-minded or even shameful. In the words of John 3, in a way that is evil. That's hard to face up to. It is easy to pretend, I don't have a problem. I'm a pretty good person. After all, as Nicodemus thought, I'm Israel's teacher. I'm a member of the ruling council. I'm going to be Israelite of the year. But Jesus says, no, if you would come to me, then you must recognise your shortcomings. We often try to prove to others. We often try to prove to God. We often try to prove to ourselves that we can measure up through our own hard work until we realise that our efforts to prove ourselves are ultimately ineffective and unsustainable. I remember reading the following quote from the Guardian newspaper. It's from Olympian Stephanie Rice a few years ago. She won three gold medals at the 2008 Beijing Olympics but struggled after retirement. This is what she said in 2017. Everything that I knew about myself and prided myself on, my confidence came from swimming. So take away the vehicle that gave me all of those feelings and all of that pride and confidence and it was like, who is Stephanie Rice? Because I only knew Stephanie Rice, the swimmer. I remember the time praying for her and thinking, God is doing something in her life. She's very good at being respectable. She's very good at being capable and successful of what she does, but she's realised all of a sudden that that's not enough. And she's wondering where to from here because she didn't know what to do. Well, that was 2017, and by the grace of God, early this year, I read the following. As Stephanie Rice reflected on life, injuries, and feeling like a failure in the sight of others, she said this. Those few weeks were my lowest yet trying to pick myself up but feeling so defeated. Don't get me wrong, I've gone through tough times before, but this was different. It was a loss of faith, of hope. That's when I knew I had to do something different and I had to surrender it all to God. She continues, and he saved me. He is putting all the pieces back together again in the most beautiful way. At times it's painful, but I know it will be beautiful. God has already blessed my life so richly and I'm excited to see where he takes me next. And I pray that whoever needs to hear this, whoever resonates with this, that you know God is with you no matter what. Consider two words, one from 2017, one from 2024. In 2017, Stephanie Rice spoke about the pride that she had in her achievements. In 2024, she spoke about surrender to God. Those two words are very different and they reflect a very different posture before God. Because why people do not come to Christ is in part because the teaching and person of Jesus highlight and show to us our failures. And so by keeping Jesus at arm's length, what we do is we get to keep our pride and our belief that we are a good person. 
But if you fail to surrender to Jesus, then you miss out on, in Stephanie Rice's words, being put back together by Jesus, having a new and beautiful life, in the words of John 3, being born again by the Spirit of God. You see, if you are someone, even the most successful of people, whether Olympian or Pharisee, if you surrender to Jesus, you will find forgiveness and life in him. So at the end of this conversation with Nicodemus and Jesus, what was Nicodemus' reply? The answer is nothing. (laughs) I don't think this was the conversation he was expecting to have. I think it was all a bit overwhelming for him. And so he had to go away and reflect. He didn't need Jesus, did he? Maybe Jesus needed him, but surely he didn't need Jesus. And yet, as we follow the gospel, after Jesus was lifted up on the cross like a snake that brought healing, we read the following from John 19. Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. Joseph came and took the body away, and with him came Nicodemus the man who had come to Jesus at night. And following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices and long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb, never used before, and they laid Jesus there. Nicodemus came, not at night this time, but in the daytime, publicly associating with Jesus. It seems as though this Pharisee had been born again through the work of the Spirit, For now he believed in Jesus. I wonder, do you? John 3.16 says that anyone who believes in him will not die but will have eternal life. Are you an anyone who is willing to become a someone who is saved by Jesus by believing in him? And as some translations have it, whoever believes. We're working through John's gospel and every week there are passages like this that are designed through the Spirit of God to show people that Jesus is worth following. I wonder, will you continue to come and hear this good news? And I wonder, who can you bring to hear and, we pray, through the work of God, believe? Who is your whoever? Who is your whoever that you are praying will come to church, whether this one or another church, because I mind not, but will come to church and, we pray, will come to Christ? For this week in John 3, we have heard of a successful person who offered Jesus respect and Jesus said, with respect, that's not what I'm looking for. Jesus is asking for repentance. A whole life turned around and transformed by the gospel of Jesus. This is a successful person. Next week in John 4, we will hear of a woman whose life was marked by scandal. But just like Nicodemus, their lives were changed. And just like Stephanie Rice, their life was changed because God to this day is at work in people's lives. And so I ask you, how by the Spirit of God is he at work in your life today? Amen. Thanks for listening. We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.